Welcome back to episode 170 of the Block Runner Podcast. I'm your host, William, always here with your co-host, Iron Man. What's going on, dude? On the sticks, we got TJ. Hello. And finally, we got Tom Lehman, the mastermind of ETH scriptions. Welcome, dude. Hi. Thank you. I'm one mastermind. I, I don't know if I would even say mastermind. There's another mastermind. Mm, one We're both of. humble people, but pretty good minds. And the other mastermind is named Michael Hirsch. Michael. He's at 0 x H I R S C H on, um, on Twitter. So, um, but yes, thank you so much for having me. I have a, a good mind and excited <laughs> to be here. Yeah. Um, and all the links will be in the description, uh, down below as well. But, uh, but yes, Tom, thank you so much. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you just off the rip. It's good to see a face. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's been a few weeks where, uh, you know, we've been diving, getting introduced to some of these ordinals founders and a lot of them, you know, faceless at the moment. Yeah. So it's good to like interact with an actual human, you know, you're on a screen, right? Yeah. So, uh, Hell yeah. kudos to you, dude, for, uh, I guess like not, not being intimidated or whatever that invisible hand force is that yeah. keeps people's identities like at bay. At, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're the I'm same uber you. doxed, you know, I have no, I'm also old. So like, I have no, like, um, but yeah, I'm uber doxed. I actually have a nicer camera that I'm not using because I am forced out of my other home office, my real home office because of a B issue oh. my hand was stung by oh, a bee. Holy. okay wow <laughs> you think it's a joke you think it's just oh poor baby it's like it's not a joke yeah okay you get your hands what kind of anyway, bee? but that's a real sting right it there. was a classic uh north american yellow jack i don't know it's was, it was, i actually didn't even see it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was so fast it happened very fast but um but yeah here's my um yeah monitor webcam uh face but yeah i'm happy to be docs i like being docs it's simpler this way and um and yeah yeah, it's, if it's great if to be out there. If your face starts to swell up or anything, we'll definitely let you know. Yeah. We, we need to take a pause. Don't, Don't tell me. Benadryl. It's too embarrassing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Cool. All right. So, um, all right. So we we have inscriptions up in the docket. We have a couple other questions. So, I guess give us a little bit of your background. Obviously, you came up with Genius.com, which was genius. <laughs> Um, there's That's a lot of people have, yeah, right. <laughs> there's a lot of people who've used that platform. Um, and, uh, I guess you had a little scuffle with Google there for, for, a, a, a section you want to give us a kind of a background on everything you've done in the past and what led you to eat scriptions. Yeah, no, the, and the Google thing is a great, a great segue. So I'll say, so genius.com was a website that was produced uh, by a company called genius, which I co-founded in 2009 and ran until 2021. Uh, 12 years, long time, uh, a lot of great experiences. We sold in 2021, and then I decided to um, see what was going on in the world and became captivated with uh, Ethereum because when you're running a company, or at least when I was running Genius, I had no ability to look at anything else that was in the world. I was totally focused. And so when I sold the company, I had a chance to look and I was captivated by uh, Ethereum. I actually had bought some Ethereum uh, due to my friend named Dan, uh, in 2017, but I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was gambling, basically, and it's fun to, to gamble with Ethereum. Uh, it's actually pretty interesting. And um, what makes it interesting is uh, very related to what happened between Genius and Google, which you mentioned. So Genius is a lyrics website, and uh, lyrics is a very search-driven sector, right? Because you hear a song, you want to look up the lyrics to that mm -hmm. song, so you search. Uh, Google is basically a giant lyrics search box. They should change the name to lyrics search box. That's basically what it is or it's other stuff too, but a lot of it is searching for lyrics. And that's how genius.com became a very, very big website. And um, one thing when you're dealing with SEO, which anyone out there who's dealt with it knows is like really good to be number one. And so this was a huge reason that genius uh, grew is that we had the best lyrics, we had the fastest lyrics, and um, and we were often number one because of this. And then people would go to our website and, um, and that was great. And with lyrics, it's really important to be fast because there's actually no such thing as lyrics. And what I mean by that is the thing that we think of as lyrics as being a fixed, uh, you know, document, which is the words to a song mm -hmm. that does not exist. It's not real. In other words, there's no lyrical piece of paper that an artist is holding up while they perform and making sure to read all of those lyrics. Mm -hmm. Right. And if there was a lyric piece of paper, artists don't always perform what they intend to perform. And maybe that's even the coolest stuff. So the point is lyrics don't exist. You have to create lyrics in a way by transcribing recordings. Mm -hmm. So that's how the lyrics you see every day are actually created by transcribing recordings, by taking something an artist actually did, not like what they did in theory, but what they actually did and listening and writing down um, 
what they said mm-hmm. and not just what they said, the ad libs. It's anyway, it's a really complicated process that everyone takes for granted. But what it means is um, it's really important to get the lyrics first, because uh, if you have the lyrics first, then you have something no one else has. And a lot of people want because mm-hmm. they don't exist outside of your transcription. So you, you win. What we found that was very interesting was that Google uh, first launched a competitive product, right? A, a lyrics product that would always be at the top of their page. So Google had search results. And then at the top, they would have Google lyrics. And that was always number one. Mm -hmm. And this is like an interesting thing, right? Because if you're number one in search, you should not be able to just uh, instantly become number one in lyrics, right? This is like anti-competitive stuff where Mm -hmm. monopolies aren't supposed to give you the ability to become a monopoly in a completely unrelated industry. But what was really interesting about it, even more so than that, was that they were copying lyrics from Mm genius.com. So essentially, they were seeing wait a minute, Genius has all these great lyrics that people want and we can't get them anywhere else. So we're going to copy and paste them using control C or control V. I assume they were on a PC, by the way, because it's corporate, (laughs) but on a Mac, a command, use them. And they were stealing all the traffic based on copying the stuff that we had done to get the traffic in the first place. So obviously this is like a very messed up and unfair thing to do. And obviously Google knows this and said many times Mm. (laughs) they they know this. Um, and they did it anyway. And the reason they did it is because billion dollar corporations in America in 2020, whatever it was, 2019, have a lot of power, so much power that it is essentially impossible to fight them and win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not impossible. Crazy things happen. Like, you know, there's some chance you could beat Magnus Carlson at chess, right? There's some chance, you know, mm-hmm. brain hemorrhage. I don't know. There's some chance, but it's like that. And, um, What that means is that if your interests align with Google's, then great. And that's how it is for most people, 99% of the time. But sometimes your interests are not aligned with Google, which happened to me the first time in this case of the lyrics theft issue. And when that happens, you will know that it's like Magnus Magnus Carlson. Uh, Google will win every single time, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we sued them and it was a whole thing and we lost and, you know, whole interesting dramatic story. They'll be reading about it in history books you know, someday. <laughs> Law schools can read about it someday yeah. when tides shift, maybe. But the point being, you can't beat big corporations. So if you can't beat them, you've got to change the rules of the game. And that's what Ethereum does. It changes mm-hmm. the rules of the game. It says, forget trying to beat Google on Google's turf. We're going to make new turf. Yeah. And this turf, Google is not going to have power to control everything. And neither is anyone, actually. Amazon, Google, all the big people, yeah. we're all basically the same. Uh, none of these people will have the control that they need to do what Google did to Genius and to what a million people do in a million places, not just Genius. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of Ethereum. It's a computing platform that no one owns and no one controls. And that's quite an amazing thing because without that, giant corporations will control everything. And so unless you are um, uh, excited about handing over the keys to all of human communication and computation and media, Hand here, hand over the keys to these giant profit maximizing corporations. You probably should be interested in the success of something like Ethereum. So that's kind of what brought me to mm. uh, Ethereum and what made me excited about Ethereum is basically maybe having a chance uh, for not the corporations to control every aspect of our lives. See, mm-hmm. I love that. That was one of the main like selling narratives that I heard coming from your story, your background story. That just because it mirrors a lot of like one of the you know the 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 real impactful, I guess, founders of the past of Web3 had some bad experiences, whether it's like Vitalik's story of like his World of Warcraft <laughs> account or character getting like nerfed or something like that. And he saw the, the you know, the pitfalls of centralization. He's like, you know what, yeah. maybe, maybe there's something I could do over here on this Bitcoin side of things and, you know, spin up like a, a computational system like you're talking about. It's a little bit more distributed, right? So we right. can take some of that control out of the hands of uh, corporations, like you're saying. So that to me is already off the bat. Like, yeah. I'm very much aligned with your thinking and you're right. You've identified like the perfect opportunity that is all of like web three. Mm-hmm. And we have these conversations a lot, like off, off camera of like how much of like, I guess the world needs to be decentralized Yeah, for sure. Finance, right? Like that's like the killer app of web three. What do you think is like the extent of, based on your experience? I'm pretty sure your answer is something in the realms of like everything. Right. But is there, is there a true answer? Maybe something in the middle in between everything in finance like what how far should this like um, decentralization e- this ethos go. of decentralization go in your opinion yeah so i think you know one thing um you know one thing someone might say is wait a minute tom 
you still have a Gmail address. Mm. I'm not going to tell you on stream what it is, but I will <laughs> tell you afterwards. If you want to email me, I'll prove it to you. And then the person might also say, wait a minute, you use American Express, but you like DeFi? Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, but also Amazon, AWS, like you're all about, you know, plot, computing platform. It's like, why do you use AWS? Are you a hypocrite? Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, uh, no, sorry, I've thought about this. I'm not a hypocrite. Um, and the reason is that centralization is not uh, bad, right? Like centralization mm -hmm. is great. Like you can use these things, but the point is you need an alternative, mm -hmm. okay? Because if you don't have an alternative, there's something called competition and all these kinds of ideas about like um, having alternatives being good. Like yeah. there shouldn't be a monopoly, basically. Correct. And so there needs to be an alternative and um, everything can't be centralized. And so what is an alternative? An alternative uh, has to be general, right? Or at least there have to be, you know, there can be 500 alternatives, right? But like the idea is a general idea. So you could have an alternative on finance, mm -hmm. you know, an alternative on speech, an yeah. alternative mm -hmm. on, you know, this and the other thing. And, and and you could list out all these things. And so this is kind of the um, the pre-Ethereum model, I think, in a lot of ways, like Bitcoin was, right, invented to be you know, decentralized peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, it's money. It's basically decentralized money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um you could invent like 50 new, there was, there's some blockchain out there, like for, you know, free speech on social networks, blockchain, like you can invent 700 blockchains and have 700 things. But what Ethereum said is, no, you just need one thing. You need one thing because we know about computer science and we know about how this stuff works, which is this idea that if you have a computer, a computer can simulate any process, uh, can simulate any protocol. And so you don't need to have uh, 50 things that are decentralized. You need one decentralized thing, which is a computer. And using that decentralized computer, you can create protocols and use cases and everything um, that you need based on the situation. So that's why I think Ethereum is so, is so great, because it's a general uh, platform that allows you to carve out a general zone um, in which you can be decentralized and not have to pick the topic in advance. Mm -hmm. Correct. Did you know that we're more than just a YouTube channel? We also built Mscribe, the first inscription platform built from the ground up for the metaverse on Bitcoin. Connect your bitmap ordinals and use our tools to bring your community into the virtual realm. Support us by joining the movement at mscribe.io. Like, comment, and subscribe for the latest alpha. Back to the video. So now let's let's talk about eScriptions and like its origin story. So how did you how did you come up with eScriptions in the first place? And when did you first hear about ordinals? Because I'm assuming that eScriptions is a is a derivative of ordinals. If and correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Yeah. No. I mean, it would be pretty big coincidence if I named it <laughs> yeah. eScriptions and it were related to inscriptions. Yeah. So basically, um, I came into Ethereum and. Um, I was very excited about the theory. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I was able to convince myself using powers of indoctrination, which is very powerful in Ethereum. A lot of people do it. I was able to convince myself that Ethereum, because it was such a good idea, that it was going to work. Right. Like imagine, like if it's such a good idea, then of course it's going to work. It's a great idea. And the problem is Ethereum does not work. Right. It's a great idea. It does not work. And that's so sad, right? Because mm -hmm. um, it would be great if it worked. The reason it doesn't work is it's too expensive. And when you are super excited about Ethereum, you convince yourself that the cost doesn't matter. You convince yourself it's going to work. And so I spent a ton of time programming Solidity, releasing NFT collections, releasing apps, doing stuff, using this very powerful notion of contracts, smart contract-driven computability um, to create uncensorable, timeless stuff that I thought was great. And it was great. And some people like to mint the stuff I did. And you know, some of it made some money or whatever. But ultimately, um, you have to drink Kool-Aid and indoctrinate yourself to convince you it makes any sense because mm -hmm. it's too expensive. It's too expensive to do anything. If you were going to breed a digital kitty, you mm -hmm. can't spend $20 on it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like insane. Yeah. Now, Bitcoin came out with ordinals. And when I first saw ordinals, I thought this is the single dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> and then I saw inscriptions and I thought, oh my goodness, something dumber than ordinals. That's amazing. Like how'd they do it? And I saw BRC20s and I thought, they keep coming out with the dumbest yeah. things ever. How do they... And the reason I had these reactions is because I was indoctrinated in the Ethereum mindset. Mm. Everyone in Ethereum thinks this, by the way. Even if they're just not saying it, they 100%. think this. Guilty. Like, no, that's what you do. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> that was TJ. He's guilty. He's a big ETH bag holder. So, of course. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's first thing you think. And, um, you know, why do you think this? Well, you think, first of all, ordinals are totally made up and fake, right? There's no such thing as order for Bitcoin. Um, it's fake. Right. So why should we believe a fake thing? It's not part of the Bitcoin protocol, so it can't be real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, OK, well, you know, everything is fake. <laughs> Driving on the right side of the street is fake. Yeah. Like, who cares? Right. Does it solve a problem? OK. 
Um, inscriptions. Inscriptions are uh, dumb because you can't do a zillion cool things with mm. them that you can do with smart contracts. You can't have like royalties or whatever. And mm. royalties are fake. But like as an example, you can't have, you know, you can't take out a loan against your inscription. Uh, and then BRC 20s are the ultimate dumbest thing because, uh, you know, who even needs to, you know, begin? Because it's like, what kind of token? You can't even split these things up. Like, mm. what is this? So, you know, essentially I saw all these things and what united them also as being dumb in my mind was that they were centralized, right? You have these centralized indexers that That's are right. responsible for the source of truth. Yeah. And I thought this stuff and I didn't pay attention to it, uh, to the ordinal's world. I, I dismissed it in one second. It took me one second to think all this stuff, by the way. All the stuff I just said to you, I thought in one second and never <laughs> thought about it again. And that's how confident I was. I didn't even want to actually evaluate the situation. I just judged it. Right. It's, it's great because you don't have to do any work. You just prejudge it. How, how, then, soon, how soon after Ordinals started did you find it, though? I found Ordinals very soon. Basically, my friend hit me up and said, because I love the punks, crypto punks, said, Bitcoin punks are, are, are minting. I said, what is that? And, and, and my friend said, she said, like, um, well, this is going to be big, like these Bitcoin punks. You have to mint the Bitcoin punks. Like, this is going to be a good thing. Yeah. And maybe you can even make some money doing this. And I was like, oh, Sparrow, like, what is this? Like, no. And then, of course, my friend made like 20 grand you know, on the pie. I made zero. So I was kicking myself. But at that point, I was, it was in my face. And that gave me the opportunity to dismiss it without thinking critically. And then I ignored it. Mm. And then enough time passed. And I was kind of like, wait a minute, maybe I should actually think about this instead yeah. of just judging it without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And um, this is an amazing idea, by the way. I, I'd encourage people to try this. Um, <laughs> And so I wrote an article, basically. I said, okay, I'm going to write a medium article where I'm going to actually, on a very literal level, study this and learn it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to um, give myself a way out. I'm going to actually write a guide on how, how this works. And as I started writing, and I was like, wait a minute, that's so weird. When I'm thinking about this more, I actually think like this is not like the stupidest thing, but maybe like the most revolutionary thing that I've heard in uh, crypto. And far from being uh, centralized, I actually realized that this is actually completely decentralized and an amazing different way of getting at this question of decentralization, how to do it. And um, and I started to think, wouldn't it be hilarious? I was joking to myself. I tweeted this. I said, I'm shocked. No one has ported ordinals to Ethereum. Like I thought, wouldn't it be funny? Because that was still a joke to me. I thought this is cool, but a joke would be bringing it to Ethereum. And so I thought, wouldn't it be funny to bring it to Ethereum? And then... Um, and then I decided to follow through. We decided to follow through <laughs> on that joke, <laughs> basically bring it, uh, right. bring it over. Not yeah. the ordinals part, but right. the inscriptions. Yeah, the, the inscriptions. So uh, your your background in Solidity programming allowed you to make the connection that the call data of an Ethereum transaction was where you can submit information that can be leveraged on chain data. It could be text all the way to like images. Um, and it, it could be taken further because I think it's base 64 hex information in, in the call data. Is that correct? Right. So, I mean, I think my, my solidity background maybe actually was part of what held me back here though, because like when it comes to programming a smart contract, you are programmed to, um, believe that call data is trash is mm. garbage. Mm -hmm. You, you look at the call data, you pull it into the great smart contract pristine crystal palace and you throw away the call data into the trash can essentially and of course what you are actually doing is you are taking something that exists and is not going actually going in the trash at all but it's going to be around forever it's the call data you're taking it and you're making a copy of it you're making a copy of it uh, using the most expensive copying tool ever in history basically which is smart contract storage so solidity teaches you uh, that call data is bad Mm -hmm. not bad, but is not a good place to store things and that you should pull stuff out of call data if you want it to be permanent and put it in a smart contract. But fundamentally, if you know Solidity, what you will know is, and smart contract, what you know is that everything, this little piece of trash, right? This thing that's throw away actually has every single piece of knowledge and content and interesting stuff and data, everything mm -hmm. comes from call data. And the reason for this is that call data is created by users, by EOAs, it's called, by people, basically. People or other unpredictable agents mm -hmm. uh, as part of a non-deterministic process called you know, blocks, putting transactions in blocks and putting them in blocks in a certain order. Everything else is deterministic on this basis. So really, you know, what smart contracts do is they just store expensive copies of data. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's super expensive copies. And that's why there's never any situation where you look as a developer at a smart contract and say, oh my goodness, I'm so excited by this interesting information. 
No, you can say, hey, I know what the information is supposed to be and it better be right. So, you know, solidity programming is basically knowing in advance the behavior you want and making sure that that happens. And uh, what this is doing, what these descriptions are doing is saying, no, forget, you know, knowing the behavior in advance, what you want to make sure happen. Forget like the state of the smart contract. Who cares? Let's focus on the thing that has actual information in it. And that's the call data. Mm -hmm. Smart contracts contain no information. Call data contains all the information. And so let's focus on it. But to do that, we have to reconceive of how we look at call data because call data, when it goes to a smart contract, is in a very specific format mm -hmm. called ABI encoded. It's like pretty confusing. I don't even totally understand exactly how it works. It's quite complicated. But instead of ABI encoding, which to ABI encoding's credit, it can store any data in a structured way, we're going to encode it in a much simpler format, in a format that a user uh, can, can understand, in a format that a web browser can understand, and that is the data URI format, which is mm. the dumber, which is the dumber and more simple way of encoding information. So we take uh, call data, which has all the interesting information. We ask people to keep putting stuff in call data and we pay attention only to call data, but we encode it in a more user-friendly way. And that's the data URI. So it can sort any type of information, uh, but it, it is encoded using the data URI mm -hmm. uh, format, which is the same as the previous properties of the call data in traditional Ethereum, where it can store any type of information, but it's encoded using uh, the ABI encoding uh, technique. So there's a difference there, but the overall idea is quite similar. Okay. Can you help me understand, like, um, once once you once you scribe something, text, uh, an image, how, how, like, functionally and technically, how, how do you transfer that ETHscription to somebody else? And, like, how, how is it recorded on, on the blockchain? Sure. So... You know, the first thing to consider here is that it's all made up, right? It is a protocol and it's like driving on the right side of the street in that, um, you know, you might say like, well, why is driving on the right side of the street better? It's like, it's not better. It's just like, if everyone does it the same way, society will work. And so this is a protocol that is similar. Um, same thing with an NFT. Like, why is my name being next to ID5 in this contract relevant? Like, why does an image appear on my profile on OpenSea? Because of that, it's a protocol. Mm -hmm. The way this protocol works is every description is given an ID when it is created. Mm -hmm. And that ID is the transaction hash of the transaction in which the inscription was created. So if you inscribe text, then you will be sending a transaction on um, Ethereum and that transaction will have call data that represents that text. And then once that transaction is included in a block, it will have a transaction hash. And that is the ID of the thing um, you just created. Now, that ID is useful for a bunch of things. Like you can look up that ID on Etherscan and then recover the data that way. You can use it on inscriptions.com. And another thing you can do is you can use that ID in a transfer of an inscription. So to transfer an inscription, you take uh, that ID and you put that as the call data of a new transaction. And that transaction will have you as the from, or at least it better, because otherwise it's invalid because you own it. Okay. Right? It'll have the owner as the from and the new owner, the two, uh, the, the person who will become the owner next, that, that will be in the two of the transaction. So if I send you a zero ETH transaction sure. and the call data is a valid ethscription ID, then you will become the owner of that ID so long as I was the owner at the time I sent the transfer okay. transaction. I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> so um, the transfer ethscription is its own ethscription. Is that correct? So that's an interesting question because um, there I'm so super basically no, because for that to be the case, there would have to be uh, uh, the inscription ID would have to be a valid data URI, which oh, is I see. Okay. incredibly unlikely. But there are some special cases where, yes, it could be that. Yes, okay. you could. Um, so, yes, that's an interesting question. But it's it's not. It's most of the time. It, most of the time, it'd be no. Okay. Yeah, and 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 ultimately, it's it's no because the the protocol states that this is a transfer inscription, and you can just kind of forget about it as long as the new person who's receiving the um, the uh, the asset came from the person who minted it in the first place or the, the, came from the person who had it in the first place. Correct. Okay. Correct. That, exactly. That makes sense. Okay. So that, that's interesting. So now I can kind of see how everything's going to like, like how everything works. So then do you see like what, what, what's like the ultimate like use case for something like this? Like, is it, is it the fact that it's completely immutable? Is that uh, we're, we're creating like a new market of immutability here? And in, in the case of like images, or how do you see this rolling out? So today it is cheaper NFT, and that is an amazing use case to you know uh, address, and people are very excited about it. And it's great. And um, another thing is, it's not just cheaper NFT; it's better NFT in certain ways. Like it's better NFT if you don't want to do a smart contract. 
So sometimes people want to create something. And on Ethereum, to create something, you have to create a smart contract first. So if you go to Manifold and you say, I want to mint some cool image, they say, whoa, 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 slow down. I know you want to mint that image, but don't you want to create a smart contract first? Mm, right, it's like, right, right. no, I don't want to do that. So this is a really cool dynamic that exists and um, and you can buy and sell these things and, and it's really um, uh, it's really great. And because they are, uh, we have a much cheaper way of doing this with the storage of the images and the text and anything you want, you can actually uh, put more content on chain than you would otherwise. So if you want to have an NFT that's an image, you can store that on chain and have it be, you know, last forever in that way, not forever, but a long time. <laughs> Uh, whereas on Ethereum, because this stuff's so expensive, you probably would link to IPFS in many cases. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of better NFT in those regards, cheaper NFT in every regard, and um, it's a really cool product. Now, it's also a uh, better, cheaper token. There are BRC20 style tokens, as I remember from your previous episode, which I watched <laughs> and got me excited about the audio quality of this <laughs> podcast. There are BRC20 style tokens uh, that you know leverage the same uh, the same concept. So, okay. you know, to me though, um, this is just the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and by this is just the beginning, I mean that the goal here has nothing to do with tokens or NFTs. I mean, it does, but the goal here is about the same thing I was saying before about like why Ethereum exists at all. Like the goal here is um, to uh, further this notion that it's good for corporations not to control every single aspect of our entire lives. It's that it's good to have decentralized computation, that that's good, yeah. right? If you don't believe that's good, then you probably don't care about this. But if you think that's good, um, you should, because there's a big issue, which is that Ethereum is too expensive to work. And there needs to be someone who comes out and says, we're going to give people a cheap way to do decentralized computation. Um, and it's going to be, yeah, the cheap way to do decentralized uh, computation. And so if you look at like, um, you know, this in the uh, context of scaling Ethereum, mm -hmm. which is relevant because everyone agrees that Ethereum is too expensive. People to disagree on what to do about it. So the main line of thought here is that instead of uh, thinking about how to get Ethereum itself to work better, we are going to move people to this thing called L2s. Yeah. So yeah. inscriptions are quite difficult to understand without L2s because this is the counterpoint. If you are considering inscriptions versus, you know, normal Ethereum, it's like normal Ethereum is better. It's just too expensive. So it's like, let's look at things that are the same price. Okay. And L2 is just like the thing that happens with Ethereum, except instead of a uh, decentralized network of validators who are, uh, you know, um, using a complicated and ingenious proof of stake algorithm to, um, you know, figure out who is in each block, what transactions are in each block and in what order and doing this non-deterministic process in a way that we can all believe is fair. Instead of having all those validators and proof of stake stuff, and L2 basically says, why don't we just have the CEO of Coinbase do it for us instead and yeah. give that person all of the power. And yeah. this is serious, by the way. This yes, is not yes, a joke, yes. right? Like mm -hmm. it's funny to say it, yeah. but it's even funnier that it, let's just say, hey, uh, let's have a blockchain that's controlled by one person. And then we have a corporation and that one person is the CEO of the corporation. And, um, you know, if the CEO of the corporation does not vigorously pursue the corporation's um, interest, then that CEO will be fired. But currently, you know, there's a certain CEO who exists and that CEO has the whole, all the power. Now, again, that's not a bad thing, right? There's Coinbase.com. I use it, right? The CEO has all the power of Coinbase.com. I use Coinbase. So are you a hypocrite? It's like, no, I'm saying the future of this thing, big capital F future should not be done in that way. And so what we are trying to say is, we are going to preserve decentralization. We are going to have the state of the dumb contract world is what we call this thing that I'll say in a second. We're going to have the state of the inscriptions ecosystem determined by a decentralized consensus mechanism, not by the CEO of Coinbase. Mm -hmm. We're going to preserve that and we're going to make it cheap enough for people to use. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of big uh, goal here. And those are uh, the stakes because if you don't do this, then you either have Ethereum die or you have Ethereum be replaced by something that is not decentralized. Sure. Uh, and both of those are bad. Or a third option, another option comes up that's not descriptions, but like I don't see them right now. So that's why we feel a lot of urgency mm -hmm. uh, for making this happen. So Tom, do you see a uh, a computational layer leveraging descriptions being built? Yes. And in fact, that's what we are working on. I even said the name a moment ago. Uh, it's a great name. I, I really am proud of the name. Um, so the it's it's funny right because we inscriptions reinterprets call data as mm -hmm. not commands to smart contracts right but rather as images and texts and transferring of those things right or json data or anything 
Correct. Yes, exactly. What we are going to do is turn that on its head in a way, and now we're going to inscriptions reinterprets call data. We are going to reinterpret inscriptions, mm. and we are going to reinterpret inscriptions as commands to a computer. Yes, and in fact, as commands to a virtual machine uh, called the inscriptions virtual machine. That is a virtual computer that runs computer programs that are called dumb contracts. Mm. So there is an Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM, great virtual machine. Uh, I don't know how they did it, frankly. It's pretty incredible. Zero downtime, like how on earth they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, respect. Um, and that runs smart contracts. And we are going to run uh, another virtual machine that is called the Inscriptions virtual machine. It's going to run dumb contracts and is going to be capable of doing everything that the EVM does at a tiny fraction of the cost. Uh, but it's going to be more inconvenient and annoying is <laughs> basically the, the pitch. Yeah. Did you know that we're more than just a YouTube channel? We also built MetaZone, the first app store for the metaverse. Buy, sell, and explore a new class of digital assets like our flagship game Rovi.ai. Support us by collecting your digital assets through MetaZone at MetaZone.io. Like, comment, and subscribe to stay updated. Back to the video. So uh, how, how does... Um... It, are, are you envisioning that there's going to be like an ecosystem of nodes running this this virtual machine, just like uh, just like Ethereum, or is it is it something else? So, our thesis is basically the reason to have nodes, the reason to have a blockchain, the reason to have any of this stuff is because you need um, you need decentralized consensus over non deterministic processes. Mm -hmm. So when you think about like the nodes that make up Ethereum and the validators that make up Ethereum in this whole process, right? It is um, centered around this idea uh, that people need to run software in order to say what the truth is in a process that's just, it, there's no way to find the truth without running the software. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of interpreting transactions and call data and blocks and all this kind of stuff, um, it is deterministic. So you don't need uh, that type of process, like where different parties are doing something in a blockchain -y way to tell you the truth. You still need nodes, maybe, like you need different people to do it, but it's much more like the way like Etherscan works or Alchemy works or Infura works, mm. right? Like when you sign up for an Infura account, or Alchemy is a better example there, shout out Alchemy, they're great. Like Alchemy can tell you, um, you know, what transactions were in a block, you know, um, or what a block hash is, or, you know, Alchemy can give you this information, um, but you don't think, okay, is Alchemy, are there Alchemy nodes? Like Alchemy sure. is one service, Etherscan is one service, all of these things just interpret the blockchain. And because this interpretation is a deterministic process, there's the idea that you can get to the truth, um, that you can double check these services, that you can make it work without having to have this thing on top of it, which is decentralized uh, consensus. You know, Alchemy sure. uh, works. You know, another example of this would be like, you know, the software that runs in you know, the Go Ethereum client is an example of, uh, you know, software uh, whose properties are determined outside of the consensus mechanism. And yet they're really part of this whole ecosystem. And they, uh, we come to confidence about what these properties are uh, through different mechanisms, again, relating to the deterministic nature of these systems. Mm -hmm. So, so that means that uh, developers are going to be using this, um, this virtual machine and and call it basically using API calls to get the latest ETH scription, basically. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the core tenets of the uh, the way it works. Anyone can try this right now. Uh, I hope this podcast is out while well, it's still in beta, but it's on <laughs> girly.ethscriptions.com. You can try this. You can create dumb contracts. Okay. You can create tokens using uh, these dumb contracts. You can trade, exchange the tokens, and then have a lot of fun, you can create a liquidity pool and you can perform swaps with dumb contracts, uh, tokens. So you can now have this inter-contract communication. It's pretty wild stuff. You, you don't, you kind of forget that you're not on a, uh, on a smart contract, but yes, you need to have uh, a different structure around it because, you know, like as an example, you know, one inconvenience is that on the Ethereum protocol, when a smart contract interaction fails, you can see that instantly, uh, you know, as part of that, you know, your MetaMask will tell you this failed. Right, you can go to Etherscan. It'll tell you this failed mm -hmm. in dumb contracts because you are just sending JSON blobs to the null address. Etherscan, MetaMask will always tell you it succeeded. So if you want to learn that it actually failed, you have to do something additional. And this is like you know the sort of the system has you know APIs uh, set up for for this. So yeah, basically um, you know that's how it work. And then there would be uh, providers who would be the um, providers of these 
you know, API endpoints of these data. And then just in the same way that Alchemy wins over Infura because Alchemy is better than, you know, maybe Alchemy will do this. The Alchemy of this will win over the sure. Infura of this because it is better. But it's really just about, you know, giving users knowledge about what is happening uh, on the blockchain and saying the blockchain itself is, is, the, is the, you know, domain of the validators. So these dumb contracts, uh, are they, they're basically a uh, code, a uh, JavaScript, uh, basically, uh, any code that anybody can, can run is it, is a specific, uh, virtual machine running what, what type of language? Right. So for the first version it is not going to be an actual virtual machine, which would be quite an achievement to do for the first version. It is instead going to be different templates. Okay. So for example, as I mentioned, you can go to girly.com. You can deploy a token. When you deploy a token, you will be asked to input constructor arguments to say the token's name and max supply and this kind of thing. But the code of the token itself, which in this case is like basically the ERC-20 token, that's going to be fixed. Now, over time, we will relax this, of course, and we'll have a real first machine that people will be able to write arbitrary programs for. It's hard to get that right. But for now, uh, that's going to be the way that it works. And these dumb contracts are going to be specified using the language of solidity so people okay. when they want to understand the behavior they will write it in solidity and then they will implement them in the language of choice as long as it matches the solidity spec now i we are going to be releasing a framework for this that is written uh in ruby that allows you to very easily translate solidity to ruby and play around with it and it's called rubidity and it's gonna make a lot of people really mad because people don't think ruby is good but i think it's great so we're gonna see that but yes for, for now it's going to be um that process in the longer term when it's going to be the you know more general virtual machine, there's going to be a way to, you know, there's going to have to be some standard language and runtime environment that we force everyone to use. So just to go back to the alchemy sort of analogy, do you, you think people are going to be running these virtual machines independently from the one that you have, or, um, is, is it just, uh, you know, anyone can come in and like run that virtual machine, run their own code on their own virtual, like basically hosting the computational environment of their own app. And, and I guess I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be other projects who run the virtual machine as a, as a host for other devs to build on top of it. It's like, is that the type of ecosystem envisioning that, that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, um, yeah, again, the alchemy, like alchemy is a way to see, show me all of the NFTs that I own. Right. That is not part of any correct Ethereum protocol. That is not part of any ERC-2721 protocol. That is something that Alchemy made up because they thought it'd be useful. And a bunch of other people did the same thing. And probably the API responses are pretty close. So that's an example of a protocol that was invented and made up. And so what we're trying to say is, you know, here's that times 10 billion and, um, you know, anyone can uh, uh, can can do it. So, yes, there, 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 there have to be other services that do this because otherwise, um, you know, the thing that makes it decentralized, it's a deterministic protocol where all the rules are common knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, it's decentralized. And that means other people have got to reproduce it and do it. And right. it can't just be one person. Right. Um, so crucial to have people do that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's starting to make sense. Um, th there's a, there's another project we just interviewed um, working on this, this BRC20 uh, component called Boss. And, it, and it's basically a Bitcoin virtual machine. That has like a very similar setup to what you're what you're discussing. That's why I'm starting to make to understand like the parallels of like how this is working because the way that I see it is right now with like Bitcoin and inscriptions, it's data that uh, that it can be in any form, right? Pictures, JSON, but there's some uh, centralized, if you will, uh, component that can take that data and do something with it, right? The computational layer. And you're doing a, a very similar thing where you have this virtual machine interpreting the data, which is in the call call data, right, of, of Ethereum, and you're doing something with it that is not a smart contract, right? So, uh, so I, I'm starting to see the parallels, and I can see this really taking off because, like you're saying, with with smart contracts, they're very expensive computational uh, functions, right? And that doesn't necessarily need to happen like that. And, and ultimately what, what you're saying is like, there's just an alternative to doing um, functional stuff with Ethereum, right? In a significantly cheaper way. Exactly. And, you know, I think it's, um, it's also a very, and this was again, an idea that came from like the ordinals thing and everything It's like, I, I didn't make this up, but like, I think there is a, um, just a very fundamental truth about um, 
when decentralized consensus is necessary. And you know, right now the way Ethereum is designed is that it, in my opinion, like it's the protocol requires too much of it. Basically, I mean, mm. it's great to have it over EVM state, but you know, philosophically speaking, um, you know, deterministic processes are just different. Like, so for example, if you wanted to say like, you know, oh, like, you know, this this protocol requires you to calculate the five thousandth digit of pi. Right. Is that a decentralized protocol? Well, no, it's centralized because you need a calculator. It's like, no, that's not how we think about things. Uh, mm -hmm. logically, it's like if 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 you know, yes, it might be decentralized today if there is a problem with calculators. If there's a world calculator shortage, then mm -hmm. you know, yes, calculating a five thousand digit of pi could be like not such a good thing to have in a protocol, but that's something that can be eliminated by being smarter about it. Um, mm -hmm. whereas if there is a protocol that says, um, hey, the CEO of Coinbase gets to tell you what's going on. It's like, you can't fix that. Like that's a broken protocol from a decentralization standpoint, never be fixed. And so that's the kind of philosophical thing um, that is happening here. It's kind of saying, hey, it'd be great to have the best of both worlds, decentralized consensus about everything on earth. It'd be great if the you know, Ethereum protocol could also tell you the 5,000th digit of pi, which I guess it can because the smart, I guess, anyway, whatever. The point being, uh, if you can't have it all, you got to choose and um, you got to choose and you got to choose decentralization about non-deterministic processes. That's kind of the philosophical core. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I totally get it. I totally get it because um, right now, like you're saying, a, a lot of us are jumping to L2s like in the Ethereum space just because it's too expensive. But with, with inscriptions, you can do many of what people are jumping, uh, you know, off, off board to L2s keep it on Ethereum, use the inscriptions, use this virtual machine and accomplish the same thing, but in, in some ways way more decentralized and, you know, significantly cheaper. Yeah. But how much, how much, how cheaper is it actually like to, if this, if this concept or this uh, model, let's say gets runaway adoption and then all this L2 activity all of a sudden consolidates back into this mm. ecosystem, like th then when do we have a problem again reoccur? Because we kind of saw that happening with with the ordinals. Like once BRC twenties yeah. were released, clearly like the mechanisms of that kind of like drove a lot of Bitcoin's like usability down the drains yeah. really quickly, right? So now the the narrative is already shifting on the ordinal space. Like, oh, we need to go to it. We need to build an L two infrastructure just like Ethereum did. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, what are you anticipating? Like, how 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 can this actually scale? Given like it is a superior um, ecosystem to uh what exists today on Ethereum. Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, again, really important to look at it in the context of L2s because, you know, again, completely dissimilar technologies, but working towards the same ideas. And so, you know, L2s um, are uh, way less cheap than people think they are basically. So if you go uh, to base, for example, and you go to base and you try to make some transactions, what you will notice is that your MetaMask, if you use MetaMask, sorry, I'm saying the word MetaMask, it's going to, you know, <laughs> bought the thing. What you'll notice is that MetaMask will say that the cost is zero to you. Okay. That is not true. That is a lie, basically. And, you know, it's bad lie is what I would say. And the reason why I use uh, inflammatory rhetoric here is because uh, I really think it's really bad. You know, MetaMask has got to fix this because people are going to lose a lot of money uh, and they are losing a lot of money on this. And the reason they're losing a lot of money is because MetaMask is reporting only the cost to execute the transaction on the L2 side, the L2 computation cost, which is basically zero because, again, it's running on, you know, Coinbase's server or whatever. Of course, that's zero. What they are not including is the cost to store the data on the L1. Every L2 transaction, on Optimism at least, is stored 100% on the L1. And guess where it's stored, right? Mm -hmm. One guess, call data, right? So this is good, right? Because without this, there'd really be no way of knowing what's going on on the L2. Like you'd have no way of knowing anything because, um, you know, uh, it would just be, you know, let me put this way. When, when L2 data is on the L1, it means you can reconstruct the L2 state. And maybe that state is um, dishonest because it's been sequenced by a dishonest actor, but at least you know what it is. So all L2 state goes in L1. And so that means is if you are doing storage heavy activity, um, it's not going to be free. It's going to be quite expensive, actually. It's going to be as expensive as creating an inscription, which is, again, cheap. It's going to be cheap, but it's way more than free. Inscriptions are way more than free to create, and uh, data on an L2 is way more than free uh, to do. You will notice this if you compare what, coin, what, what MetaMask says with what 
you know, base scan uh, says. So by this, I basically mean to say that when it comes to data storage, L2s and um, uh, uh, what are the ones that I'm looking at? Inscriptions. L2s and inscriptions are basically going to be the same. Mm. And okay. um, both are going to clog up the L1. And this is the idea, right? This is the dream is that <laughs> yeah. uh, it'll be completely clogged and fees will be super high and it'll be great. And ETH price will go up and, you know, who benefits from that? Like not everyone equally or whatever. It's a whole complicated thing in my, yeah. uh, in my mind. But yeah. uh, that's the idea. Now, yeah. L2s batch the transactions. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to inscriptions, you have the cheapness of storage. That's like the L2, but you have a uh, you, you you have the transaction sequenced by the validators, which means your transaction is one to one with a validator transaction, which means you pay the overhead, which is twenty one thousand gas. So and you have speed issues too. With thinking of costs with an L2, you can jam a zillion things into one transaction, and then they share the overhead of twenty one thousand gas, and that can make things. Uh, a lot cheaper. So mm-hmm. fundamentally, uh, the goal of both is from the L1 standpoint to fill the block space and increase the fees. But uh, L2s uh, give you additional cheapness by having less overhead, uh, but you have to have someone else do the sequencing and then you lose the benefit of the decentralized sequencing. So that's kind of the uh, the issue. That's the calculus is uh, as an L2 user, is the benefit of lowering that overhead good enough to overcome the cost of having a um, you know centralized sequencer and um, if so, and it will be in some cases, maybe in a lot of cases, if so, you use the L2. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to go the other way, uh, use uh, use inscriptions. But yeah. um, that's that's kind of the idea. They should be very comp- comparable in cost, yeah. and um, they have that that small but important difference, which is the um, the roll up sequencing thing. Mm. Yeah, I think it definitely um, it, it it refers back to what you said earlier. It's always good to have, I guess, options, not just have like one mm-hmm. monopolistic, I guess, model. In any ecosystem or any like you know situation in general, right? So right now we're all operating off of smart smart contracts, and then we're we're kind of like forced to digest this yeah. current day situation, right? But now you're presenting something completely new, with its so its added you know its pros and cons and whatnot. But the, yeah. the big breakthrough here is now we're not pigeonholed as developers to just you know only do it one way, right? Yeah, and and uh, so our our background is uh, so we we have a, a project that that was on Ethereum. And uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. pretty quickly, we learned that the fees forced us to go search for an L2. And at the time, we were like, is it going to be Matic when it was called Matic? Is it going to be XDAI? Mm-hmm. And uh, and ultimately, while, while we were doing our research, ultimately Matic won because they, they switched their name and you switched to Polygon. And all of a sudden, it, like it took off and was like, well... It, lo- it looks like everybody's using Polygon, so let's just jump on that. And then so we switched to Polygon. And uh, you're ultimately right. Like the the fees are not negligible there either. And pretty quickly, it could also get congested. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and so kind of the the ability for developers to have to choose or be forced to go into L2s and like deal with all that, that stuff as well. Mm-hmm. It's like now that we have an option with these scriptions, like now we can be a little bit more creative as like how we implement our solutions, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that we have this um, this test environment, Gorelli environment that we can go and test this uh, this virtual machine because I feel like it's it's something that we need to explore because you know, like, like you were saying earlier, it's like this, this fee, this, this, this fact that we have to force ourselves to like build smart contracts when we necess- we don't necessarily need to do that. Like it gives us more freedom. So yeah. Yeah. it's a good way to think about stuff. Yeah. Hell yeah. I love it. And if you go to that site, follow, there's a guidebook that says how to create a DEX on dumb contracts, which is like a cool sounding idea, right? A DEX on dumb contracts. That sounds interesting, but there's like 10 steps involved. There's like more like 14 steps involved. Yeah. I wrote it all out. Um, no one has actually followed these instructions. They are too complicated, but uh, there's there's a payoff. I've done it, actually one person at least. So I encourage anyone listening to this or anyone hosting this podcast, please follow those instructions because it will be hell, but you will see the magic at the end, I promise. So this DEX you created, is it, can people use it? Is it uh, like live or was it just a testing? Yes, no, it is, it is live. Um, well, I don't want to get, but yes, it, you can look at the pre-existing tokens or, or dumb contracts rather on the page, and you can see which DEXs have been created. And if you look on the DEX page, which you can do by clicking on it, mm-hmm. you can see the tokens uh, that are in the DEX, right? It's not a DEX, it's a liquidity pool. You can okay. see the two tokens that are in its pair. And then if you go to those tokens, um, you can mint those tokens probably unless they're minted out. And then, um, 
you know, do a swap on the on the decks, basically. So yes, you can use those, uh, or you can create um, your own. Okay. So the um, there's a couple of ERC twenty tokens that were minted as each descriptions. Are are these like backwards compatible to this virtual environment that you're creating, or do we have to create specific tokens that are compatible with that ecosystem? Right. So that's a good question, and um, you know I think it's it's interesting because the tokens created using inscriptions were kind of the things that first started like open my eyes to the, the idea that like this could be really big this could not just be because those are computer commands right deploy right. you deploy a token right. like that's different from you know digital artifact these were the first computer commands um but uh the new system is not going to be compatible in a direct way okay and the reason for that is that we want the new system to be general and general in you know, from the day one. And by that, I mean, you should be able to do the DEX liquidity pool. And the way the old system is designed, you kind of have to add this stuff um, incrementally. And I support that. And I support anyone adding functionality to that side of things, that protocol. But to use them with dumb contracts, you're going to have to do a migration. And that's going to mm. be possible sure. uh, where you burn one for the other, but also migrations are a pain. So I think if it's working for you in the old system, you should use it that way. But yes, the, the native tokens in the new system will be the ones that are supported in the DEX and all kinds of other things, lending, borrowing, whatever it is. When do you anticipate this uh, this new ecosystem launching? When's this podcast coming? Yeah, sorry, the <laughs> date, I don't know. So, um, you know, so one thing, and, you know, I just want to pat Michael and me on the back and just say like, we could launch it right right now. Like it works basically. Like there are some um, aspects of it that um, not so user-friendly, but it works. There are multiple contracts that we've done. It's all good. But, um, you know, it's kind of what you said before where I don't want to launch something like the way it is now, it's like a cool demo. And, um, you know, you know, it's working because you know that your screen is updating based on uh, transactions that are JSON that you're sending to null address. So you know, we're not actually running a smart contract, but how does it work? Does this feel great? Like, am I going to put money onto this? Like, I want it to be more, the, the biggest challenge now is just making it more visible and more reproducible. And so I want to come out with some software that's going to allow people to basically, um, you know, I don't know how far on this I will get before launch, but the idea is to come out with software that will allow people to create and run their own sandbox dumb contracts to create and to, to run the production ones in their own sandbox, to mm -hmm. throw stuff at it, to convince themselves uh, that it works and to feel good about it. And then ideally to begin developing round two of like the next round of, of, of dumb contracts. So I want to create some more visibility there. Um, but functionality wise, it's uh, it's dumb. And, then, and the other final thing is just that we're trying to turn over in our heads like, you know, uh, one great advantage of smart contracts and the way they interact with the world of proof of stake and everything is that there's this thing called ether, right? Which is a made up thing that uh, is completely made up, but uh, it does things, it has value, people ascribe value to it, it works, and you can send ether to a smart contract and mint something or whatever. That does not exist on dumb contracts. There is no mm -hmm. way to send ether to a dumb contract. It just does not, you know, there's... It, not part of the Ethereum protocol. So because of that, uh, you have to uh, invent ways of getting around it. And so one way of getting around it is if someone creates a cool piece of art um, on dumb contracts, you can buy that piece of art from them and you can figure out a way to, to do that and that'll be fine. Um, but what if uh, no one creates a piece of art that you like, right? What if you want to have value on the dumb contract ecosystem? Um, this is something that you would need a bridge for basically. In other words, you need a bridge to you know get in but getting in is easier to get out you need you need a bridge concept you need someone to be able to uh say here is a token that is one for one with eth and we will buy it on the way out from you and you want to worry about you know selling it and so this is a fairly common concept right a bridge but it is something that uh adds a layer of complexity to launching an already brand new system and it is something that uh, at the same time seems very necessary we actually did implement a bridge um, that's also, if you hunt around in the uh, demo, you can see a bridge that has a smart contract that you send money to the smart contract that mints you a token on a uh, dumb contract world. Um, but I want to make sure we obviously get that right because sure. um, that's not, that's a whole other problem, but I think also very important. If you want people to come here and do stuff, you can't just say, um, you know, wait on the sidelines until you find something you want to buy. You know, you have to say bridge yourself into here. So that's another big challenge that we have to sort out before we, you know, commit to a launch plan. Is the concept of um, indexers, does it apply to ETH scriptions or is that like um, just like an exclusive uh, ordinal thing? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I would call these indexers. I mean, to me, when I say indexers are uh, viewing the blockchain, mm -hmm. not interacting with the core blockchain, in other right. words, letting the validators do their thing, viewing it and then interpreting it for users. 
And, um, you know, I think uh, indexers are absolutely essential for anything, right? Uh, Ethereum runs on Etherscan. If Etherscan had a bug in it, the entire world would blow up basically yeah. like indexers really important very few people go down the street and talk to their friend mr or mrs smart contract you can't do that actually you have to talk to some piece of software and you know and some level you know the indexer is really important so uh that is what is going on indexers are uh taking uh the reality that exists and reporting it to to users and so you absolutely need indexers um in ethereum period and you definitely need them also in inscriptions yeah, I guess when we were uh, in the mix, like building this stuff, like um, on Ethereum, we kind of took these indexers for granted. Like we just assumed that they were just correct, but uh, that assumption uh, was clearly uh, not not true because any time that you rely on on an indexer, there's a chance that there could be a bug, like you're saying. And if there's a bug on EtherScan, the world explodes, right? So. Um, <laughs> It makes sense because on ordinals, right, there's these meta protocols that are being developed by individual indexers, and they're sort of creating their own ecosystem of truth. And not all indexers have the same data, right? So it became, it becomes a problem. So um, I don't know. Do you, do you foresee a way where we can sync up these indexers, like to, to for everyone to have the same truths? Or are, are developers going to create their own ecosystems within each scriptions that say, Hey, I have a, I have a, an app and this app is about, uh, you know, the metaverse and, uh, you know, and I, I figure out a way to do these, these actions and these, and, and these inscriptions and they mean something in this ecosystem, but a separate indexer may not be in support of that. Is there any way for everyone to sync up here or are we stuck with like silos? Yeah, no, this is a huge issue. Um, and it's something that I want to, um, you know, I think Bitcoin, as I mentioned, I think a moment ago, like Bitcoin was the pioneer. Um, and so they faced a lot of these problems, you know, firsthand. Yeah. I hope to have the benefit of watching this go down uh, and avoid some of these problems. And that's a benefit of being a copy paste person rather than the pioneer, essentially. And so, you know, I think what you describe is a disaster, essentially. Like, you know, people should be able to fork things and start their own thing, right? Like this happened with uh, Ethereum, you know, it, Ethereum Classic exists. There was also a big fork that they called the merge for some reason. It kind of yeah. was a weird thing they did. They're good marketing. Though forks are great and open protocols mean let's do forks, but you shouldn't fork by accident. In other words, you shouldn't fork by accident and you shouldn't fork because it's a passive lead through resistance. You know, forking should be a higher level of resistance because the protocol should allow you to do the things you want to do. The protocol is doing a bad job when it's too complicated or impossible to do the things you want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, if you disagree with the protocol, you know, you should fork. And so, you know, I think forks are bad. Uh, for users, right? Forks are great for development of open protocol, but no user wants to do with a fork. Fork is a nightmare, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it's good thing that Ethereum doesn't have Ethereum Classic as the same size. So you want to stop forks for users um, in the sense that like you want to give users a clear choice. Yes. You want to give people the ability to fork and create a better option that users go to. Like that's great. It's no yes. protocol, but you got to balance these things. So, you know, my feeling is that what Bitcoin is missing is a uh, meta paradigm thing called dumb contracts, basically. I think you can go around and say, I want to invent 50 protocols. And if you go around and invent 50 protocols, then you're going to end up with a mess that's incomprehensible. It's impossible to implement and impossible yes. to use. Yes. Yeah. So there needs to be a layer where there's a framework for inventing protocols. There's a framework for putting these things together. And that is a computer, in my opinion, because you know that's gotcha. what worked on you know, Ethereum, a smart contract. So my hope is that, you know, A, um, if everyone implements the same virtual machine, it will be a lot easier to support every protocol. Gotcha. If it's a lot easier, we can mandate that you have to support every protocol. Like that's it, right? And of course people can fork. Uh, and, um, you know, it'll be beneficial to 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 do that because, uh, you know, there's no reason to fork over some minor protocol. If you want to fork, it's because you think inscriptions is rotten to the core sure. or something, or sure. you, know, you want to change something. So that's kind of the idea. But yes, we're absolutely trying to avoid that. I think that's really the nightmare scenario that kills the entire thing. I, I totally agree. Hey, we're, we're seeing that right now with ordinals and it's a pain in the ass. And uh, I, I, I totally in agreement with you as well on this whole virtual machine thing. And everyone has to get on the same page here, because if, if not, we're going to be dealing with um, fragmentation and a lot less users as a result. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we got about a minute left, Tom. Is there, I guess, anything anything else you want to say in terms of like release dates or? You can um, speak on, um, I saw that on Twitter, you guys recently got accepted for Gitcoin. That's right. Uh, grant process. So 
Yeah, definitely. If you could break down exactly what that is <laughs> and um, how that's going to aid in this development, because yeah, clearly this is not some small yeah. initiative. You guys are trying to do a lot, and I think you're going to need a lot of support from a community of not just developers, but you know, interested you know ecosystem participants. Gen developers. There you go. <laughs> Whatever you want to call them. Hell yeah, yeah. No, I um, I thank you for bringing that up. And yes, Gitcoin is a very confusing thing to me. Um, it's complicated. It's a big ecosystem. It's amazing. It funds public goods, and it does so in a really interesting way. And we were really honored to be part of the uh, what was it GG. Gitcoin Grand, hashtag GG18, mm -hmm. and we're in the Ethereum infrastructure category, which means that this is nice. you know, our peers and we are really, what we're really about is um, you know, improving the uh, infrastructure of Ethereum. And we think, well, hey, if you can make it possible um, and more accessible for people to uh, perform decentralized computation on Ethereum, that's pretty good for you know, the infrastructure, what we're talking about here. So we're really excited to be part of that. We think we're good. Um, I cannot uh, tell, it's kind of complicated. So one thing you can do is you go to eatscriptions.com at the very top, there's a link to our page, okay? Click that link, and um, now you can try something, which is you can create a passport. So don't kill me on this. It's basically a way of proving you're a person, and it requires you to say, okay, I own an NFT, I've owned an ES name, Do we need to scan an eyeball? No eyeball no, scanning, no. although I would cover your eyes just to take your <laughs> monitor. Uh, no, I, I, I like the passport thing. I think, you know, these are tough things to do, and someone's got to do it, and they've done a pretty good job. Okay. So check that out. If you can get above 20, that means you are a very valuable person. Uh, even if you can't, the way it works is quadratic funding, which means that a small amount of money from a lot of people is super helpful. So if you can donate $2, you will help us a ton. Okay. Uh, you have to bridge to an L2 to do it. Isn't that ironic? No, yeah. that's not ironic. It's not hypocritical. It's good. This is a good use of an L2. It's transactional. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. Anyway, donating $2 is amazing. Go to eScriptions.com. At the top, click the link to our Gitcoin page, donate $2, and um, you'll help us a lot. At the same time, you know, if we're talking about money, okay, it's like uh, you can also help us a lot by spending money on gas, testing inscriptions, and giving feedback and making your own stuff and trying it and whatever. So also do that. But this Gitcoin thing is cool, quadratic funding, um, inscriptions.com, click the link at the top, honor to be a part of it, shout out Gitcoin. You know, it takes, uh, you know, we're, we're next to some pretty big names, you know, Ethers.js, heard of them, like pretty big. So yeah. uh, Gitcoin was sort of saying, hey, you know, Ethereum is three months old and uh, they should be in the same category with the um, uh, the people that are literally the example of who should go in the category. And so um, uh, it's dope. So happy to be there. And thanks for the support. Yeah. No, th thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah. We're definitely going to support this because it's important and it's a new way to use Ethereum. So and also, it's it's like a. I think we should. I don't know. Like um, almost make a statement to um because a lot a lot of our audience is like ordinals focused. Yeah. And even if if whatever it is, this whole tribalism energy that kind of permeates yeah. throughout crypto and stuff, just because this is happening on Ethereum is something we should totally fade. You know, fuck those guys. Yeah. But that we can't. Somehow do that. we all need to kind of like align and understand we're all in the same bucket, right? And this whole digital artifact movement that's kind of yeah accepting here now it's starting to happen on Ethereum. It's going to push the whole damn space forward if we can all kind of support each other, right? It's like you were saying, Tom. Everyone faded um, ordinals when they first heard about it. Everyone <laughs> well, faded included, yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin when yeah. you first heard about it. Everybody faded it. Yeah. But I think we've all learned we can't fade any new ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we got to support new stuff, right? Because that's how we move the, the maturity forward. That's right. Yeah. Hell yeah. I agree 100. Yeah. percent I will never fade anything again. Yeah. That's my promise. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Sorry, Same. I'm fading all the time. No, I'm trying not to though. Yeah. Now, on. now, now, starting now. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's do it together. All right, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Uh, all the links will be in the description. And um, and Tom, again, I really appreciate you. You're, you're more than welcome to come back. Talk about any updates. Um, we're in the DMs, so definitely hit us up there whenever you're ready. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh. Great to be here. Really appreciate it too. And, um, and yeah, we'll be back. We'll be back with some new crazy stuff. You know, I just want to say, if you're listening to this, I'm in the DMS, I'm at dumb name numbers on Twitter. Uh, there's discord.gg slash inscriptions. Uh, I want to know, um, what you think. And if you're fading it, uh, hit me up because, um, maybe you're seeing something I'm not, and I can use that to improve. Like it's not lost to me. This whole thing came from, uh, reconsidering, uh, yeah. dumb ideas that i had so yeah. there might still be more so please uh hit me up and i'll see you all next time awesome Perfect. dude thank right. you tom take it easy bye awesome